this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMED PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the business document section on the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN website. Present or introduce rather Dr. Kate Lowry from IU Health, and she's sharing a recent study on connective plates. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about connective plates versus ultiplates in acute ischemic stroke, or better known as the TRACE-2 trial. A quick overview of the thrombolytic medications that we all know and love. So they're synthetic to tissue plasminogen activator, so it converts our plasminogen to plasma to help facilitate that fibrin breakdown to bust the clot open. So the differences between TNK and ultiplase that I wanted to highlight is that tenecticlase is a genetically modified version of ultiplase, so it has an increased selectivity for fibrin and is more resistant to the plasminogen activator inhibitor, and it also has a longer duration of action compared to ultiplase. Uh, the relative contraindications for these drugs are plentiful and would not fit all on one slide. So I included the absolute contraindications for using thrombolytic. And then some of the adverse effects that we can see with these drugs is angioedema and intracranial hemorrhage, about 5% for each of them. Doing a further comparison between the two, connectoplase is an IV push given over 10 seconds, whereas ultiplase is a bolus followed by an hour infusion. As I mentioned previously, the half-life of connectoplase is 130 minutes compared to ultiplase, which is 72. The dosing differences, we'll get into the dosing of tenecteplase a little bit in the background, but we've landed on 0.25 mg per kilo with a maximum of 25 milligrams and ultiplase of 0.9 mg per kg with a max of 90. There is a little bit of a cost difference between these two medications, about $2,000, which may come into our comparison at the end of this presentation. So relevant stroke scales are going to be important for going through these. The NIH stroke scale is long and complicated, so I broke it down into minor, moderate, moderate to severe, and severe stroke scale. And then the modified Rankin score, the score from zero to six, that really is helping with patient's quality of life, and it's been a common descriptor throughout multiple trials, thinking of how patients can be independent after a stroke. So we'll go through some connected place literature review. On a timeline, there's been a lot of studies going through this medication. I want to highlight the ones in gray. These are looking at LVO specifically undergoing thrombectomy, and the red is kind of all comer. So quick going through the extend and extend part two is kind of I, what I like to think about as the dose finding study for tenecteplase, where we looked at 0.25 mg per kg versus 0.4. Um, and in this trial, we saw that there is more symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage with the high dose TNK. Uh, that's kind of where we ended up landing on the 0.25 going forward. But there's a lot of dose finding between that. And some of the studies that just looked at patients, all comers, not necessarily LVO undergoing thrombectomy, they looked at independent at baseline with a symptom onset of four and a half hours. And they really found lots to be similar between tenecteplase and ultiplase. The Nortest 2, again, looking at the higher dose of tenecteplase, had more symptomatic ICH, which was statistically significant. And that kind of was the last trial that utilized that 0.4 trace, tried a 0.32 mg per kg versus ultiplase, and they also found no difference. And then the most recent large trial was the ACT trial, which had 1,550 patients, which is one of the larger ones we've seen. And they also found no difference between the two agents. And now we have TRACE2. And so the goal of this trial was to determine the non-inferiority of tenecteplase and ultiplase eligible for thrombolysis, but they were ineligible or refused thrombectomy. Looking at our study design, it was a multi-center study, 53 hospitals throughout China. It was open label, randomized, but it had a blinded outcome assessment. Their patient population was anybody that was eligible for thrombolysis as long as they had a baseline modified ranking less than or equal to one, a diagnosis of ischemic stroke causing a disabling neurologic deficit, and they had to have an onset within less than four and a half hours. So definitely comparable to the other trials. They did have an extensive and very explicit exclusion criteria 
So some of the ones I wanted to point out is if you had major surgery within the last two weeks, if you had a GI or a GU hemorrhage within the last three weeks, you were also excluded. I also wanted to highlight that patients were not included in this trial if they were eligible for thrombectomy at randomization, but if time went on and by provider judgment, they were able to be rerouted to thrombectomy, they were still included in this analysis. The outcomes of this trial were are consistent with previous literature, so they're looking at excellent functional outcomes, which is defined as a modified Rankin score of 0 or 1 at 90 days post-stroke. Some of their secondary outcomes I thought were interesting was the favorable functional outcomes, which extends the modified Rankin to 0 to 2, and also substantial neurologic improvement in their NIH score at discharge. So they defined this as a decrease in their stroke scale by four points or any score less than one at discharge. The Barthel index score of 95 points at 90 days is interesting. It just kind of highlights a patient's ability to complete their ADLs on their own. And I think that's an important measure to use. Their safety endpoint, their primary safety endpoint was a symptomatic ICH within 36 hours, which is based on some of their guidelines. They also included any intracranial hemorrhage or any other hemorrhage within 90 days, and they did perform repeat MRI imaging throughout a patient's admission. Going through their statistics, they needed a sample size of 1,430 patients to reach 85% power, and they were looking at their primary endpoint using a modified intention to treat and per protocol population, so they kind of split it out. Their modified intention to treat was any patient who was randomly assigned and received the assigned thrombolytic. Per protocol was all patients who completed the treatment without protocol violations, and there were no missing data for any of the efficacy endpoints. They looked at the non-inferiority criteria and predefined that if the lower bound of their confidence interval was greater than 0.937, it would meet inferior, non-inferiority criteria, and superiority criteria statistical analysis with a Z-test could be performed at that time. Their safety endpoint used everyone in the intention to treat population, and they used logistic regression or Fisher's exact test, which I think is appropriate. They did not quite reach their enrollment. So they had 1,417 patients randomized, and then that broke down into their modified intention to treat, and then their per protocol below that. The main reason for exclusion in this study, it was the use of contraindicated medications within 22 hours of thrombolytic administration. So looking through their supplemental, it, the majority of patients who were excluded for this reason got antiplatelets like within 12 hours of their thrombolytic, and so they were excluded from the analysis. The baseline characteristics between the two groups were very similar. Um, I did want to point out that there was a majority of patients who had an NIH stroke scale of less than eight. However, looking at their inclusion criteria, they also, was, their score was greater than four, but less than eight, I think kind of accounts for a lot of patients we see that don't have a large vessel occlusion. I was a little surprised that their door to needle time between the two, 60 minutes, 58 and 61, which is similar, and their symptom onset to needle time, I thought was a bit of a unique marker. They didn't include like a symptom onset to door going off of that. It's a little bit more prolonged than what you might think. I did want to mention that patients that did end up receiving a thrombectomy throughout the trial was 4% in the tenecteplase group and 3% in the alteplase group, and none of these differences between the groups were statistically significant. Looking at our primary outcome of the excellent modified Rankin score at 90 days, they did meet their non-inferiority criteria in both the modified intention to treat population and the PER protocol, with that lower bound being 0.98 and 0.97. Neither of these populations met their superiority criteria. I think it's interesting to talk about that it, again, is non-inferior compared to what we know as the treatment of choice. Taking a look at our secondary endpoints with a favorable modified Rankin score is very similar, 73% versus 72%. And the improvement between the score at admission and at discharge with 68% had an improvement versus 66%. They did not document whether or not this improvement was uh, the reduced score or an NIH less than one, but 68% uh, and 66 did have an improvement nonetheless. And looking at the Barthel index score of greater than 95 points, which means that the patient really could function um, and do their ADLs, like getting dressed and feeding themselves at home, was 70% versus 69, so very similar. 
None of the secondary outcomes reach statistical significance, but this is very similar to what we've seen in the previous literature. I wanted to include this infographic of the actual modified Rankin scores at 90 days, um, just to take a look at the visual with 33% reaching the zero score versus 31.9. So there was numerically hum higher number in connected place getting a zero, but none of these were statistically significant between the groups. Looking at the safety endpoints, the symptomatic ICH within 36 hours was 2% in each of the groups. Any ICH within 90 days uh, was 6% and 7% respectively. However, they reported that still only that 2% were symptomatic at 90 days. So the remaining 4 or 5% were just found on imaging, but not symptomatic per patient. The other significant hemorrhage events within 90 days were similar and death at 90 days was 7% versus 5%. So talking about like the mortality and the ICH, there were numerically more in the connected place group, but this did not come out as statistically significant, but I think it's worth mentioning. And talking about their adverse events, I didn't really see anything reported that I really would have wanted to see. They did mention just briefly that they didn't have any angioedema in this trial, but it wasn't something that they looked for um, they didn't talk about any difficulty controlling blood pressures in these patients or injection site reactions. The authors came to a conclusion that tenecteplase is not inferior but not superior to altiplase for the treatment of ischemic stroke within four and a half hours of symptom onset. Um, I think that is a valid conclusion to come to from this study. <laughs> kind of diving into the discussion and what I thought of the study, some of the strengths, I thought they had a very practical inclusion criteria with a decently large sample size compared to the previous trials, did look at a specific patient population of the Chinese ethnicity who have had worse outcomes previously. So I think that's unique to add. They used an outcome, their primary outcome, which is consistent with previous literature, so it makes it very easy to compare. And they did report stroke mimics in their exclusion criteria, which I think has been a weakness in some of the previous trials. So I thought that was great to include. Some of the weaknesses is it had an unblinded medication administration. They had an underrepresentation of moderate to severe strokes, a majority having an NIH stroke scale less than eight. In the 53 centers that they included, they didn't report whether or not they're a primary or a comprehensive stroke center. So it's difficult to interpret how equipped hospitals were and what interventions they could offer these patients. And the adverse events that they provided were really difficult to interpret um, in the supplemental. They had things like connective tissue disorders were included as well as like neurologic dysfunction. And it made it a little bit more difficult to sift through. So I'm not quite sure what they were looking for with that, but it didn't really include some of the things I wanted to see as I discussed previously. All in all, this trial adds to the body of literature that tenecteplase at 0.25 mg per kg is not inferior but not superior to alteplase for the treatment of acute ischemic stroke. I think we've had a lot of different studies showing that it's non-inferior with large vessel occlusions going to thrombectomy, patients who are not going to thrombectomy. We've had a lot of dose-finding studies looking at the 0.4 mg per kg versus 0.25, finding that the efficacy between the two medications is very similar. We've had nothing to show uh, that tenecteplase is superior to alteplase. However, I think that looking at the comparable treatment efficacy coupled with its like ease of administration, a push dose rather than an infusion, makes it easier for preparation, nursing, and just easier to do in general, as well as the cost difference, the $2,000 difference uh, between the two medications really pushes the pendulum over to favor tenecteplase um, just from a logistical and cost saving standpoint. And I think having, you know, just adding more literature to that efficacy definitely has clinical significance. My institution at IU Health started using Tenecteplase as our agent for acute ischemic stroke in October of 2022. After the ACT trial came out, I think is really when we started using it. And I think more centers are kind of moving that way. And maybe this additional paper may allow other institutions to have enough body of evidence to also make the switch. And with that, I can take any questions. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. 
join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only and does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.